Welcome to our webinar, Off the Clock, The Economic Outlook, Doom and Gloom, or Flamingos in Mumbai. My name is Sharon Lydon. I'm the Associate Dean of Alumni and Corporate Engagement, and I'm so excited that you're here this evening. This evening, we've partnered with Samantha Harold Barrett, Assistant Director of Regional Engagement for Florida, and Masana Lam, Assistant Director of Regional Engagement for California. And so we've invited Rutgers University alumni from all of California and all of Florida and who are with us this evening. So I'd like to offer a special welcome to our Californians and our Floridians. We'd also like to recognize all of our EMBA alumni and current students who have joined the webinar this evening. So a hearty welcome to you. Before we begin, it's my honor to introduce Rutgers Business School Executive Vice Dean and Professor Yao Mensa. Dean Mensa has served in a leadership role with the Dean's Office for many, many years. And over the past five years, Dean Mensa has worked closely with Dean Lay and Dean Yusle to transform RBS into the top ranked public business school in the Northeast. Dean Mensa. Thank you, Sharon. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening to hear more about the current economic outlook. I'm looking forward to hearing more from Professor Langdana and Dan Stowe. Farouk is the director of the Executive MBA program, and there are many EMBA students and alumni watching this webinar. We are very proud of our EMBA program, and there are very many accolades this program has received. Our EMBA program is ranked number two in the world by Financial Times in Economics for the third time. The EMBA program is also ranked in the top 10 in the world in economics for about eight times already. Just this year, the EMBA program was ranked number 10 in the world by the economist for the quality of the EMBA faculty. We're also very proud of the momentum of regular business school as a whole. Financial Times reported on what leading business schools are doing to prepare students from less wealthy backgrounds for a successful business career. A total of four business schools were interviewed and reported on. And these schools are Harvard, Columbia, the University of Southern California, and Rutgers Business School. Again, I, want to I would like to thank Farouk and Dan for taking time from their busy schedules to share with us the economic outlook especially during this pandemic. And I thank all of the alumni here for being able to show up for this, to uh, listen to this seminar this evening. Sharon, back to you. Thank you, Dean Mensa. I have a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, your microphones will be on mute. Our webinar will end at 8.15 p.m. And during the next 50 minutes, Daniel Stahl will interview Professor Langdana. And if we have time, we will open up to questions and answers. You may submit questions within the Q&A field that we will try to address. And you can submit your questions anytime throughout the Zoom webinar. So I'm pleased to introduce Daniel J. Stahl. Daniel Stahl is Director of Communications and Marketing at Rutgers Business School, where he oversees public and media relations, branding, marketing, social media, and website operations for a top public business school in the Northeast. Before coming to Rutgers, he was a vice president of institutional strategic marketing at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Dan also founded the English language newspaper, The Slovak Spectator in Slovakia, where he met his wife, Rennie, and has taught English in China Spain, and Slovakia. He earned his Bachelor's of Arts from SUNY Oswego, majoring in history and political science. His son, Mark, is a freshman at Rutgers. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dan Stahl. Sharon, thank you. Hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Farouk Langdana, our featured speaker tonight. Dr. Langdana is a professor in the Finance and Economics Department at Rutgers Business School, 
and is also the director of the globally ranked and highly regarded Rutgers Executive MBA program. His areas of specialization include monetary and fiscal theory and international trade and global macroeconomic policy. He has published several articles as well as five books in this area. Dr. Langana is the recipient of the Horace DePodwin Research Award and more than 30 teaching awards, including the highest possible teaching award at Rutgers University. He even has a classroom named after him at the business school. In addition to his role at Rutgers, Dr. Landana has taught extensively in China, Singapore, and France, as well as in Iceland and India. All of his courses have a genuinely global outlook. He earned his MBA in finance, master's in economics, and PhD in economics from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Farouk, welcome. It's good to see you, you know, even virtually. So much has happened in the past six months, it's hard to understand what's happening in the economy. Uh, the budget deficit's rising, unemployment is rising, political uncertainty, while the stock market is close to record highs. I've often thought to myself during this, all of this, what would, uh, I wonder what Farouk would think. Well, tonight we get to hear from you. So let's get going. Uh, let's start with budget deficits. Um, Farouk, right now the deficit to GDP ratio of 16% is the highest it's been since the end of World War II. With massive amounts of money being created, where is the hyperinflation? That's a great question, Dan. And before I answer that, um, thank you everyone for being here. I asked for the guest list and um, I saw names from my very first years at Rutgers um, and then executive MBA, day MBA, New Brunswick, Newark, the evening classes, and also people who are in the program now, in my class now, or who I'll see on Sunday. So thank you for being here, but there are over 400, I think close to 500 people who'd signed up. And uh, I wish I could see you all, but the trade-off is, even though I can't see you, we can all still be on the same platform, thanks to this technology. So that's the compromise. But I want you to know, I know you're there, and I recognize all the names, and thank you. It just uh, it's good to have you back and good for you to be here tonight. So the deficits, where's the hyperinflation? Huge question, Dan. And you know, back in the day, we had the sustainability thing. So let me just go to the whiteboard and let's, let's use the Microsoft whiteboard. I like that one the best. And hopefully you can all see this now. And so back in the day, and back in the day is before 2008, before the subprime crisis when the whole world changed, okay? So back in the day, if we had deficits, G minus T, greater than zero was a budget deficit, right? Government spending, which is G, larger than taxes, that's a budget deficit. So we had this convenient ratio of G minus T divided by GDP, you know, which we will call Y. When it was less than 5%, it meant that we could run this deficit forever and ever and ever. It was known as being sustainable, sustainable. And which meant that I could borrow from person X for one year and this person represents a large Chinese insurance company and time to pay her back next year and borrow from person Y who represents a large European hedge fund and time to pay person Y that year, following year person K, person A, keep rolling it over and over and over and over forever. And that was sustainable, a bond finance sustainable strategy. And this is why I like the Microsoft whiteboard. You can just move it up. If it was greater than 5%, it meant it was non-sustainable and the sky was supposed to fall on our heads. It meant non-sustainable meant the rest of the world would say, hey, what are you Americans doing out there? We aren't recycling any more money. We aren't lending to Uncle Sam anymore. <laughs> what are you guys doing? In the Reagan years, it was 6.4%, 6.4% and all the red lights came on like, hey, we became non-sustainable. And non-sustainable means that a huge monetization. It's monetization is just a fancy word, monetization. Simply is in huge monetization is inevitable. 
What this means is you have to print money like crazy. It means the rest of the world stops lending you money, stops lending Uncle Sam money to finance the deficits. And the only option is you print money and you print money. And it's always been extremely dangerous because non-sustainability of deficits often, often led to hyperinflation. And hyperinflation is just a complete meltdown. Generations who have been in hyperinflation never forget them. I'm here, many of you from my classes have seen this before. You know, let me uh, stop. Well, I'll show you. Maybe you can see this. It's 100 trillion, 100 trillion Zimbabwe money. 100 trillion, worthless, by the way. You don't ever want that. Um, German hyperinflation, Venezuelan hyperinflation, Venezuela is still going, Zimbabwe is still going, and almost 40% of Zimbabwe is gone. They've left the country. Anyone with any kind of labor skills like you folks out there have long left the country. Uh, they've gone to Singapore, they've come here. Um, so we don't want that. So that was terrifying. It was the end of the world. The sky was gonna fall on our heads, not an option. Then came 2007. 2008, 2007, 2010, the subprime crisis, and the ratio became 12%. 12% guys. The highest before was 6.4. And we thought, that's it. It's the end of the world. Sky's going to fall on our heads. Nothing happened. We printed money like crazy because we had to finance the massive deficit. So we printed money and everyone thought, oh my gosh, this is more money. Then we did something called quantitative easing, which is we bought all the rotten mortgage-backed securities from all the bad boys and girls who are left holding them when the music stopped in the subprime crisis. We bought it off them. 48 billion a month from 2008 to 2015. 48 billion a month went down to 24 billion. So no country has printed more money than us on this planet. Okay, look, where is the hyperinflation then? So, We're thank you, Dan. So, <laughs> exactly. So, you're going, thank you, Dan. So, you're going, hey, so you should have, we should be wandering around wallpapering our houses with this, which is what it was used for, or lighting fires with that. What happens in hyperinflation for it to happen is the money that's printed has got to be spent. Let me give you an analogy. A poisonous snake bite, venom from a cobra, can only kill you if the poison goes into the bloodstream. If it doesn't go into the bloodstream, just an annoying bite, you're fine. And so the money is not spent. So what happened, by the way, that venom story, I'm not a venom expert, so don't try it at home, okay? Okay, so, but you get the, you get the message. What happened in the old hyperinflations is when we printed money, German hyperinflation, Zimbabwe, Hungarian, it was already spent. We were paying the soldiers who hadn't been paid in two years. We were paying the, the, the nurses who hadn't been paid in six months. The teachers, the, the farmers who hadn't been paid in a year. So as soon as we printed the money, whoop, it was in circulation. And wham, 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 prices sometimes doubled every half an hour. This happened, this 2007, 2008, when we bought all those rotten mortgage-backed assets, we gave money to the banks to those institutions who essentially sat on it because nobody was borrowing the money. That money did not ripple into circulation. No hyperinflation. And one major reason the money didn't ripple into circulation was a liquidity trap. And I'm gonna explain that in a minute, but essentially bottom line, when you print money like crazy and it just sits there or the poison doesn't go into the bloodstream, you don't die. There is no hyperinflation. So does that mean, Farouk, that budget deficits don't matter? So huge, yeah, yeah. huge question. So let me just really quickly talk about a liquidity trap. This is important to answer your this question too. Liquidity trap is what we are in, what Japan was in, what Europe's in, what we've been in since 2007. So it's very important. I'm gonna give you just an intuitive explanation. Here is I, this is borrowing. So this is Bristol Myers Squibb wanting to borrow 20 million for a new lab. So this is borrowing. This I bar is investor confidence. 
con investor confidence. And let's put up just 0.5 as some parameter times the interest rate. This is controlled by the Fed. Okay, let's put in some numbers here. Let's say this is 10 and let's say this is six. And so this is four. So what we have here, investor confidence is 10. This number here, which is tied to the interest rate is six. And so $4 billion is what we'd like to borrow. This is private borrowing. This equation here is the DNA, the motherboard equation for central banks, for monetary policy. So it's important that we understand this. Now let's say that we decrease interest rates. So we make this four. The Fed basically, the Fed increases the money supply, prints money, interest rates fall. And so the Fed has lowered interest rates to four. And this is 10. And look at this, this is six. And this simplistic relationship is what Trump believes. What most of the talking heads on TV believe. If you lower interest rates, capital investment will go up and the economy will jumpstart. Oh, the Fed's gonna lower interest rates. Recovery is coming. Everyone's jumping up and down. And you will see it means nothing. Oh my gosh, Fred's not Fed's not lowering interest rates. Oh my gosh, it's just this, that's awful. We're gonna be dead in the water. So there's this simplistic belief that you lower interest rates, capital investments go up since it's cheaper to borrow and the economy will move forward. Look at this now, here is a liquidity trap. What happens if consumer confidence also for investor confidence here also falls. And this is where I'm taking you. It falls from 10 to four. And you can see nothing happens to borrowing. It negates the effect of lower interest rates. And I needed to plug numbers in here to just show you this is a liquidity trap, guys. It means that you can lower interest rates till the cows come home, cows come home and there'll be no change. You can take, you can lower it from 0.75% to 0.25% or from 0.2 to zero, which is kind of where we are. It's not gonna make a difference. So wait, how does that, what happened to the deficit sustainability model that you showed in the beginning? So basically what this means is therefore, Dan, look at this, this happens from six to, where was it before that? It was six to four, six to four, you can lower interest rates interest rates decrease because money is printed. Money supply has gone up. So what this means is you can increase money and you can increase money and you can increase money and nothing's gonna happen. It's not gonna cause inflation. You see, this is what, this is what quantitative easing was. You can, you can increase money till it's 0%, but there's gonna be no poison going in your bloodstream because nobody is borrowing anything. Think about it, why would I borrow 2 million at 0.01% if six months from now, two months from now, a year from now, there's gonna be a trade war. There might be a war with China. There's gonna be a civil war, whatever you're worried about here. Why the heck would I borrow? Investor confidence is low, liquidity trap. But Farouk, the if investor confidence is low, why is the stock market going up so much? Right? Great question, Dan. Before I leave this, I just want to tell you that this combination of everything I told you, deficits don't matter. Mm -hmm. And Dan, you actually had asked me, that was part of your questions. Stephanie Kelton, this economist wrote this book a couple of years ago and got hugely famous for that and jumped, people jumped all over her, but she said deficits don't matter anymore. There is, first of all, we attract global capital in our country. We are the safest haven right now the safest cave, if you remember my cave theory. So that's when the whole planet's in turmoil, global capital floods in and helps finance our deficits, no matter how large they are. And then the resulting, the difference that we can't finance with global capital comes from printing money and you can print away because it doesn't go into the bloodstream. Liquidity trap, as long as investor confidence, this baby is dead in the water and that baby is dead in the water, we can print money and this whole package was known as modern monetary theory, where deficits don't matter, print money as Bernie Saunders said and Alicia Ocasio-Cortez said, 
Alessandria Ocasio-Cortez said, fund the green jobs, free college tuition, modern monetary theory, and guess what? Trump's doing exactly that now. All these bailouts, all this money, all these transfer payments, COVID help plans, the rescue plans, it's all modern monetary theory. We are printing trillions and trillions and the sky is not worth falling on our head. And I call this circumstantial macro, Dan. You know, like circumstantial evidence, like I said, Dan, somebody broke into the museum last Thursday and that guy was wearing a black polo shirt. You're wearing a black polo shirt, so you are the guy. You broke in. Circumstantial evidence, right? Which is thrown out in court. This is circumstantial macro. We had a liquidity trap. You know, we printed money. We were heavily non-sustainable. We dodged a bullet, the sky didn't fall on our heads. Keep doing it again. As long as the global economy is down and as long as capital comes in and as long as the poison doesn't go in the bloodstream, go for it. So I call this circumstantial macro. The stock market. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what, you know, from the stock market is, has been going up this summer and the last couple of months, but the unemployment's going up. I mean, we hit 8.4% nationwide. In New Jersey, it's almost 11%. New Jersey, you know, New York, it's 12 and a half percent. Yet there's this party in equities. It doesn't seem like yeah. it's, <laughs> there's a party in equities. What's going on here? Bro? Please help. Yeah. Me. So there is a party in equities. Uh, I love that. And, um, you know, it is scary. It's almost, and I read somewhere, someone described this as a K recovery. So it's a K-shaped recovery where one spoke of the K are people who are on the stock market having a party in equities. The other spoke of the K are people who are lying awake at night, who are working three jobs, who are praying for the 300 buck extension that the government finally threw at them. 13 million kids are getting one meal a day, maybe 14 million kids. Um, the jobless claims, first time unemployment, every week the number comes out. Back in the day, 200,000 was considered a tight labor market. 450,000 people looking for jobless claims, first time, was considered a recession. The number is 900,000 now. And it was up to a million. So there's devastation out there. We haven't recovered anywhere from anything. And yet the market goes up. One reason is this liquidity, which I mentioned. All this money we printed has to go somewhere. And much of it is flowing into the stock market. So a large portion of the run-up in equities is caused by this massive liquidity. You remember, 48 billion a month, and then 24 billion a month in the subprime crisis. And now again, massive quantitative easing. We're just pumping money into the economy. Keeping the trying to keep oil in the engine. I understand why we are doing it, but that liquidity has to go somewhere uh, and all the past liquidity. So that's fueling the run up. But I also want to point out the fact, let's go back here um, to the Microsoft whiteboard. And is that there's negative real rates. This is important. So let's talk about that. So here, this is, let's go back up here. So this R, this is the real gain to the lender. And real cost, to, so these are real rates. For those of you who remember your macro, real cost to borrow. And everything is being um, recorded, by the way. So we'll be sending you the link. And what I mentioned in the modern monetary theory, there's a huge blog on that I've written. And by the way, all my graphics in my blog come from Dan. So Dan, thank you. Um, and to read my blogs, just Google Langdana blog page. Langdana blog page. It'll take you to my Rutgers website page and then scroll down. And the graphics are, all the graphics are from Dan. And Dan, while well, I'm on that note, thanks to you and Jessica and Josh for all the help with our website. Yeah, you make us and the whole business school look good. Thank so you. thank you. So this is the real rate. This comes from the Fisher effect. If you remember your macro, the real rate is equal to I minus pi. So I is the interest rate and pi is inflation. Okay. And this is important. So what we have now is a situation that looks like this. This is 0.7% interest rate on say 10 year treasuries and inflation's around 1.3%. So we have 
negative real rates, folks. What this means is, let's change the color. What this means is that if you park your money in a savings account, you're getting 0.7%, let's say, on a CD or whatever. But if inflation over that period is 1.3%, then you've lost money here. This, a negative real rate, does not encourage saving. You see, so it's almost like termites have gotten into your safe deposit box, assuming you're saving in that, and eaten away your savings because you lose money in an interest-bearing account because inflation is more. And so a negative real rate, which is what we have, basically pushes you into riskier assets. And so typically is the first step to bubbles. All bubbles, I'm tempted to say, begin with the negative real rates. It says, you know, what the heck? I'm losing money. And you know, you get all those cliches. I want to make my money work for me. And all the stuff you hear, crazy Kramer and all that stuff. And so you go in to the stock market. And what's happening is the negative real rates, that's the tailwind causing people to get out of treasuries, get out of CDs and seek riskier investments. That's important. And also, you know, every few years you get another generation and now it's technology stocks and you know, you get momentum investors, right? So these are people who think they have a better angle on the new technology. And so Farouk, is there a disconnect between what's happening in the stock market and the real economy? Absolutely, Dan. Okay. Thank you for saying that. There's a huge, and there usually is. Do, and you know, this happened in class a couple of weeks ago and where I had to actually stress, do not, do not, do not confuse the stock market with the real economy. For the real economy, do what Keynes did. He opened his window and looked out and he saw the unemployed people and the, the paradigm then at that time was there can't be unemployment in the classical model. There's no such thing as unemployment. And he said, what is that? What is that? We'll work for food. So open the window, look out, look at the pain that's out there. Entire sectors were actually in trouble before COVID. Retail was in trouble before COVID. There was a trade war. Exports were in trouble before COVID. After COVID, I'm going to show you, we had to shut the economy down. So there's a lot of pain. And, so the, um, but the Fed, the Fed seems to recognize this, right? It switched its uh, average inflation targeting, you know, instead of the, the 2% target it used to use, it's trying to use this average inflation targeting. Is that going to help, you know, the economy you. recover during the COVID shock we're living through? Great question. Thank you. But before I leave the, uh, the bubbles, don't be a momentum investor. Be very careful. There's a lot of liquidity out there. And just remember, this is a sobering thing that I was told in grad school and that's impressed me a lot. Every time you do your homework, every time you think you know a little bit better, a little bit more about the asset, about the company, about the technology, you, you appreciate it a little more than everyone else and you've come to a bad decision. Just remember at the other end of the, on the other side of the table, somebody just like you has done their homework, is equally confident and has come up with a sell decision to sell to you. It's a sobering thing. Always store that away. So Dan, the Fed. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about, well, I'll give you some background. Yeah, I saw that. They've gone to the average inflation rate and there's a lot of fuss over that. It seemed fairly innocuous, but it's been distracted a lot of attention, it seems. So let's back up. In 1946, we came up with a mandate for the Fed. The Fed's supposed to create jobs. It was the Employment Act. And they're supposed to get full employment. Good. It was very Keynesian. The Fed had to increase money supply, lower interest rates. This is that equation I showed you. <clears throat> lower interest rates. So capital investment would go up. That's, that, that's why I showed you that equation. Good. Then in 78, we added Humphrey Hawkins. <clears throat> Humphrey and Hawkins, sweet guys but they, had, they were clueless with macro, sorry to say. So they added, they should get full employment or large employment. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks, when I... <clears throat> I'm 
So they said, <coughs> let's bring in low inflation too. So they added full employment and the Fed should get low inflation. It seemed to make sense. Why not? 1978 was a stagflationary time, right? Inflation was high. So to me, it's like, you know, you're going from McDonald's and <coughs> you get your corner pounded and they say, you want to add fries to that? And you go, you know, why not? Low inflation along with full employment, might as well. And we will see that thing makes no sense. It's the biggest, most amazing thing. And I'm glad you asked me that back to our whiteboard. So here we go. Here is the Keynesian model. And here is the good old Keynesian model. And here is, this is Y max, Y is output folks. Y max at full employment. So I'm just giving a little background history. This is the aggregate demand and you can move it back and we Keynes taught us how to move this out. And this is jobs on this axis and this is inflation. This is prices inflation on this axis. Just a lightning review. So Keynes said we could move this curve out to the right by increasing money supply and decreasing interest rates or by increasing government spending on good government spending infrastructure as he called it and by cutting taxes. Those were the three buttons. You could move the curve out, jumpstart the economy. So the Fed had this mandate to move the curve out by lowering interest rates, which was this monetary policy thing, and taking us there and getting us Y maximum, maximum output at full employment. This is the supply curve, the aggregate supply curve. This is the aggregate total demand curve. Good. But then they added 1978, we should also have low inflation, Humphrey and Hawkins. And you can see that's physically impossible, macroeconomically impossible, because look at this. What happens is when you do the full employment thing, you also get higher inflation. You see what I'm saying here? So they go hand in hand. When you get more jobs and more output, you get higher inflation. So high inflation goes hand in hand with a growing economy. It's called demand pull inflation. And so the Fed's mandate is lots of jobs, lots of growth, but low inflation. It's not possible. It's fundamentally inconsistent. So isn't that the greatest irony here is that Humphrey Hawkins, which is the Fed's mandate, is not possible using monetary policy because inflation actually goes up. And the, the goal for inflation had to be less than equal to 2%. So, <laughs> which is somewhere in here. So it is the most amazing thing. Twice a year, the Fed chairperson goes in and has Humphrey Hawkins testimony. And before the Senate Banking Committee and people like me just scratch their heads and they're like, they're, you know, they're like, what is that? It's not even possible. Why are they all acting and playing along? So that is the most amazing like twilight zone kind of policy objective the Fed has. So what we do is we still have it because it's kind of useful to have it. If inflation is too high, we can say we are doing Humphrey Hawkins and bringing inflation down. Or when jobs aren't there, well, I'm doing Humphrey Hawkins, I'm creating jobs. So we can just pick and choose parts of this macroeconomically inconsistent thing as and when we like. So, it's like an inside well, joke. You think that will, will help the economy recover? I mean, yeah, so what we have here is, uh, so instead of this target, 2%, Dan, now we have an average target. So what, what he's done now is, if inflation was 1.5%, Jay Powell says, let's take inflation up to 2.5%. So the average will be 2%. You see what I'm saying? In other words, may I take inflation up a little higher and move the curve out to the right? And sure, but the thing is very important folks, this, you must understand this folks, for this curve to move out to the right, for us to jumpstart the economy, if we lower interest rates, and if Dan Stoll needs, rushes out and borrows it, that's great. But if you lower interest rates and Dan Stoll and all you guys out there go, what the heck, go ahead, lower interest rates, increase money supply. We aren't gonna go and buy houses or vacation homes or build new labs liquidity trap, liquidity trap. You can increase money till you're blue in the face. We aren't going to go borrowing it. 
And so that guy is not going anywhere. So this so, is just... So does that mean it, the deflation is in the cards for us? Because wow. I mean, there, are, there are a lot of countries like what, Japan, Greece, Spain. Thank are, you for asking that, um, Dan. That's logically perfectly the question. Actually, interestingly, a couple of days ago, my dear friend, Steve Parenti, who owns ProCare here in Flemington asked me the same question. Steve's the reason Langdana is not limping anymore without surgery, by the way. So yeah, deflation is terrifying. And many countries are at deflation. We are at 1.3% inflation. So anyway, here's a diagram. Aggregate supply, aggregate demand. Here, in, here we are at 1.3%. This is prices or inflation. This is why the economy is minus 12%. <laughs> I can't believe I'm putting these numbers, 10%, who cares? We are contracting. Um, and so please understand, deflation would be this. So here would be minus 2%, let's say. And here Y would be minus 20%, whatever. So uh, deflation is way down. And deflation is prices turning negative. That's different from disinflation. Disinflation is inflation rate from 1.3% to 1.2%. That's disinflation. Prices are still growing, but growing by less. Deflation is prices turning negative. Uh, in the Great Depression, it was minus 25%, by the way. And this was minus 30% in the Great Depression. Anyway, deflation is a killer because the moment it happens, consumers stop buying. And consumption is 70% of our economy, seven zero. So if consumers stop buying, which COVID made us do, by the way, um, but even to a larger scale, then because you know, you're know you thinking, why buy the uh, refrigerator now? Let's wait a few weeks. Why buy a car now? Let's wait another month. Why put on a new roof now? You know, prices are collapsing across the board. So people postpone consumption. And that just cascades the economy into more and more trauma. It also becomes very hard to borrow. Borrowing shuts down. Again, what happens there is real rates become very positive. What it means that if I'm borrowing from you, when the time comes for me to pay you back, it's gonna cost me more because the money I used to pay you back is now worth a lot more because of deflation. So borrowing shuts down, high real rates, you know. Um, um, it's a killer. I don't think we'll be in a deflation because we've just been, the money we are printing now, this modern monetary theory thing, and do, do go to my blog page, it's keeping oil in the engine. You know, the stuff that we are printing and we're pumping in the economy, that's just to keep oil in the engine. That's not to jumpstart us or have growth. That's not gonna happen. And I'm gonna show you in the next few seconds. It's just to keep oil in the engine. Because what we have, let me show you the COVID shock here. What we have here in COVID is here's the aggregate supply of the economy. Here's aggregate demand, okay? And here we are P0, that's inflation rate. Let's say it's Y low. So Keynes showed us what to do if output was low. Keynes taught us, you can move this curve out. This is demand side, this is Keynesian. Move the curve out by increasing monetary policy, by cutting taxes by having large infrastructure projects or bring it back down to soft land the economy. So Keynes taught us that. But what we have here with COVID is it's a supply side shock. Here's aggregate supply. It's not the aggregate demand, which we know how to move. It's this baby here. This is COVID, wham. It's like 9-11, it's like an oil shock. And this is pre-inflation, this is why People, we, are, we were at Y low to begin with. Look at this, Y very low. This is like the monsoon failing in India. Um, this is like the famine in the Old Testament. You know, Pharaoh had this dream, seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. That was seven years of drought. That was an agricultural shock. Um, and there's nothing, listen carefully folks, you can't do a darn thing. A supply side shock is like a body blow. You just take it. 
you wait. Somebody in my macro class, an executive MBA asked me last week, so don't supply side shocks go away? Yes, in the past, the war in the Gulf would end. You know, the, the Yom Kippur would end yesterday. The war would end, the Shah of Iran crisis would end, the oil shocks would go away. 9-11 kind of burnt off finally. The monsoons will come. You know, the flood will, ab will abate. The, the, the whatever, agricultural shock would go away after a while. Not so with COVID, that baby is still around and it's a body blow. Moving the aggregate demand curve, we know how to do that. The only way we can move the aggregate supply curve, by the way, there is no quick fix. And supply siders try to move that to the right. It's productivity increases. It's massive innovation. It's huge effective corporate tax cuts, not the bogus ones we had, which went into share buybacks. It's productivity. Um, no quick fix. These are long term structural things. So we don't have that. We don't have. So basically there is no short term thing. But what happened with COVID is our response to COVID was we had to shut the economy down. So we had to do a self induced coma. So we had this was move one wham, supply side shock, move to, we shut the economy down for the spacing, for distancing. And so here we are. So inflation is, P is low, low inflation. And look at this, Y, very, very low. So this was move two. It was a one, two punch. <laughs> it was a self-induced coma. And the COVID came and made our world dark. And what did we have to do? We had to turn the lights out make it even darker. So there's a one, two punch. And all you can do is wait this baby out, come up with antibodies, guys. All you researchers out there, vaccines, I'm gonna do it too long. One, two punch, Dan. So, so to short answer to your question, I explained where it's coming from, this 2.5% of this average inflation rate, but no, it's, uh, it's just public consumption. It's not gonna make any, make any difference. So how does that, um, is that, how is that explaining the oil prices? Cause, so, cause in, in May it felt, you know, it was like under 13 bucks, you know, per barrel. And, you know, now it's hovering around 40. So what, what's going on with the oil prices in this? Yeah, you know, I was very happy to be honest. And I, it was bizarre. Oil prices were down 13, 14 bucks. And I thought, great, it's great for the consumer. And I couldn't understand it when there was some Trump rally and President Trump was going, I'm going to make sure oil prices go up. And I'm going, everyone was cheering. And I'm going, you want to pay more at the gas station? What? I'm, am I going to wake up and say, that was a weird macroeconomic twilight zone episode I was in, where people were cheering higher prices for gasoline at the pumps. What was that? Anyway, so oil prices, let me take you back to my whiteboard. And I'm thrilled that oil is less than 60 bucks a barrel because there's so much going on with oil, Dan. There's a geopolitics of oil. So as long as oil is under 60 bucks a barrel, Putin cannot have adventures. I should say misadventures. He doesn't have the money because Russia, all Russia has is oil and some weapons. It's an empty shell. Don't be afraid of it, guys. It's an empty shell. You click on it and you get error 404 website not found. There's nothing there. Don't be intimidated. So under 60 bucks a barrel, Putin can't afford invasions and he, let me show you. Let me take you there. Microsoft whiteboard and share. Let's go back up. So this was the old oil story. Let's use black. So here was aggregate supply of oil. So back in grad school for most of you, aggregate demand, here is inflation, this is the price of oil, P0 oil, this is quantity of oil. It was a supply side story, it was a commodity. So an oil shock was the classic textbook example of a supply side shock. There's a problem, trouble in the Middle East, boom, oil is curtailed and we get cost push inflation. This was commodity inflation. By the way, this is why China is so paranoid because the accesses to China can be blocked so easily. There are a whole bunch of islands as opposed to India, which is wide open. So China's terrified that by controlling a few key straits, 
all its supply chains will be blocked. It's all about supply chains. Today, it's all about supply chains. So this was the old story. Oil shocks, oil would fall, oil would be curtailed. We bring the Shah of Iran here. Well, they stop sending oil to us. That was the old story. What happened is when India and China woke up, oil also became a demand side story. So oil became a demand side story. Let's get out of this. So essentially, as India and China woke up, oil became a story like copper, um, cement. It became a commodity. More people are driving. There's more infrastructure, oil, um, zinc, lumber. So it became a demand side story. And oil became a proxy. The price of oil became a proxy for global health. As the global, as the planet recovered, oil prices would go up. As the planet would essentially slow down after COVID, this way, oil prices would fall, 13 bucks or whatever per barrel. So when the economy slowed down and shut down, oil prices would fall. So oil became a proxy, it became a demand side story. What's interesting that happened with oil is that there were two things that happened. Since you're interested in oil, aggregate supply, sorry, this is supply of oil. This is demand of oil. So the first thing that happened was there was a glut. Oil producers cranked up the production of oil because there is a sense out there that 2020, and I love this, this is peak oil year. Oil demand globally is gonna start falling. More electric cars, in California now, more fracking. So this is oil from the OPEC countries, the 22 group of 22 or whatever. So they wanna get that baby out of the ground and monetize it as fast as they can. The gravy train is ending soon and I can't wait for it to end. So basically they've been cranking up the supply, but at the same time, we shut down the world economy because of COVID. So here we are, look at this. So it's a one, again, a one, two punch. And so we shut down the economy. People are driving less, the fewer supply chains, the fewer petrochemicals being used. So the demand for oil went down. So this was initial price of oil, P0. And look at this final price of oil, P final, 13 bucks a barrel, or under, under around 40 right now. So. This is from here to here is the drop in oil due to the glut, as an oil glut. This is one to two. And two to three here was when we shut down the world economy and oil is a proxy for the health of the planet. So it's a double whammy, bang, bang, and oil prices collapse. And interestingly, you know, back in the day in the Obama administration, we actually would work with the Saudis Saudis who've constantly played both sides against the middle, by the way, and you have it here from me on record. And so to bring the price of oil down, so Putin, who was adversarial to us then, as opposed to now, he's got a swipe card to the White House now, you know, he just wanders in and wanders out. You know, you go into the White House, in the pantry, there is Putin pouring himself a cup of coffee. Yeah, you know, that's what I see. So, so it was adversarial then. So we worked with the Saudis to get the price of oil down to keep Putin out of trouble. But Saudis being Saudis, their agenda was to get rid of our fracking. As they helped us with the oil against the Russians, it took the wind out of our fracking. When the prices fall too low, we shut down our fracking. So there is no altruism there. You have to and try and figure out what the agenda is. And the oil, the geopolitics of oil have been very sordid always. So for a Thinking about the global economy at this moment in, in history, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Where, where are we at? You know, what's interesting, Dan, is there, it's rebounding out there. So global trade is up. South Korea, China, Vietnam, uh, the, the big exporting countries for merchandise trade, they're actually at pre-COVID levels. So there's a massive China is actually really recovering. You know, just, you don't want to buy their numbers, that's fine. But if you look at China's imports of copper and zinc, you know, the, the proxies for global growth, that infrastructure is happening, growth is happening. China is again in the, in the game. China is growing. 
Um, there's a sense that Asia has managed COVID better. Uh, even Europe, there was firmness in Europe. There was a sense that Europe had managed COVID better than us, but saying managed COVID better than us is like saying being south of the North Pole. You know, I mean, so given the situation here. And so that the Euro has been firming up for a while, but global trade is back to pre-COVID levels. Um, there's a Baltic dry index, which I like a lot. That's an index that's based on the price, on the price of a cargo ship, a freighter for carrying bulk cargo. Baltic Dry Index. And that index, that's the rental price of these ships, is a great proxy, I love that one, for the health of the planet. Infrastructure is happening. And if, if, the, if it's like a sine wave, you know, the cycle for Baltic Dry, we are right in the middle again. Um, so so the, the planet is waking up, we aren't, the planet is waking up. Oh, by the way, Dan, sorry, for, the, for indices, I meant to mention one, you asked me about the stock market earlier on, and I, I was thinking of a stock, if it, the stocks came up, there's a great index that you folks who are in the market may want to look at. It's kind of a fun thing. It's called the Fear and Greed Index. It's a Fear and Greed Index, 0 to 100. It's a contrarian index. It's at 49 now. The, it's, the market doesn't know what's going on. It's waiting for this debate, whatever, to see who's going to win, whatever. But check it out. If it's over 50, it means the, it's too much greed. It market's overvalued. You need to get out. If it's under 50, it means that it's too much fear. Everything is undervalued. You need to get in. So it's like a fun incidental auxiliary index. Poke around. Fear and greed, you'll see it. I just meant to throw that out there. I mean, speaking of fun, I mean, part of the title of tonight's talk included flamingos in Mumbai. Um, you know, you wouldn't tell us what that means. So what, what does that have to do with anything, Fro? <laughs> you know, Dan, I'm thinking 70% of you guys out there are here just for this. Like, what the heck is Langdana? How will he connect that to this? So, you know what? Right when this COVID thing happened, um, earlier on, just a month into the big lockdowns and shutdowns, we all got the same WhatsApps and the same Facebook links and the you know, the videos that within minutes of each other, right? So we saw animals coming out of the woods. We saw peacocks in the streets of Bombay, sitting on cars. We saw, this is like a month after the lockdown. We saw huge herds of deer on uh, Oregon well, coasts, on Washington coasts, you know, fawns running into the waves and the waves chasing them back. They were never seen before. And this happened in a month. And we saw, believe it or not, flamingos in Mumbai. I'm gonna show you the picture so you, here you go. There's the title, there they are. That's flamingos, never seen them, I'm from Mumbai, I cannot believe this. And um, so why am I showing you this? It's because to me this was a revelation, really, that nature can heal so fast. There were black panthers in the cities in Bombay, walking through the main streets. Um, you, everyone saw, and these things would come fast. You know, I would send a clip, a video clip on my WhatsApp to somebody, to Rosa Oppenheim, my colleague, and she would say, frog too late, got this 20 minutes ago, you know? So they were whipping through from India, from China, from Singapore, from my students in France. Within minutes, you would get two, three, two, three um, copies of the same link. I'll never forget, by the way, a quick digression here. All those books started coming out about Trump, you know, Trump's sister and Trump's driver and Trump's lawyer. And so I would have, you know, Rachel Maddow holding up the book and say only five, 10 copies were released and I have one. And boy, there are some doozies in here, you know, all bubbling over with excitement. And I feel like telling Rachel Maddow, I have one too on my phone two minutes ago from Bobby Bronstein, my alum, who's in here somewhere, who got it from South Korea. And the book from the driver, you know, so you have uh, Chris um, uh, from CNN, um, and he would say, yeah, you know, I got this only a few copies were sent out and I got one of the early copies. It's on my phone from Bobby Bronstein, who controls the global network for information, I'm thinking, you know? So anyway, so I got this several times from people and I was, 
amazed at how quickly nature popped back. And I'm thinking that the healing takes place fast. And once we have this COVID under control, you know, there's a sense to be entrepreneurial, to come up with the next big thing. I'm hoping that that healing will take place as fast as this, because this was remarkable. Within a month of the shutdown, the animals were back. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. And this is a remarkable sight. And they stopped because they noticed there was no pollution in the water. So they decided on the migratory path to stop. Yeah, that's an incredible photo. So, Brooke, you know, we have to ask this question. The, the first presidential debate is in about an hour from now. Gosh, yeah. So, I, I mean, what advice would you give the candidates? Uh, and then, you know, since it is debate night, and, you know, I know you well, but I don't know really what you are. I don't know if you're, you know, Keynesian, a supply sider. You do love Reagan all the time, but are you liberal, progressive? What? I mean, can you can you tell us? Can you? Well, you know, first of all, Dan, I want to lodge a complaint with the organizers of this debate. I feel like the debate is the Rolling Stones, and Dan and Langdana, we are the warm-up band. So I'm filing a complaint. I'm protesting here. It should be the other way around. Um, and regarding supply side or Keynesian, I. I was hoping that would come up. My even Wednesday night class of 2017 gave me this gift. It's I'm a supply side economist. But then when you turn it around, it says I'm a Keynesian. So they, they have my number, I think. So it's like this. On 9-11, we were all Keynesians because the Keynesian model has buttons to press. It responds to shocks. You can increase government spending, good government spending, you know, infrastructure and that sort of thing. Good in quotes, of course. Um, you can increase money supply, lower interest rates. You can cut taxes. So there was a role for that. And George W. Bush himself swung to the Keynesian model on 9-12. Subprime crisis, Keynesian. You know, there is no, the, the supply side model has no quick fixes like I showed you. Um, it's a long-term structural model, supply side. So again, Keynesian. But then the Obamists went too far with the regulation, sadly. And it was very adversarial, the relationship with the corporate America, with the suits, very adversarial. And so Trump pressed all the right buttons for right in quotes because, and he swung the regulations back. Boy, did he swing them back to the other extreme now, you know? And so it depends on the situation. It depends on the situation, like these bailouts in putting oil in the engine, that's a Keynesian thing really. Um, but what advice would I give them? Um, Dan, if I could speak it, talk to the contenders at the debate. In terms of macroeconomics, I would tell them there are no quick fixes. It's a supply side shock. Moving the supply curve out is a long-term thing. But what I would push for is the fact that there are so many extraneous shocks we have put on ourselves. You know, these are self-inflicted wounds on this economy. Those we can fix. The biggest one would be this trade war with China. Absolutely useless. Um, it, I thought initially maybe it would get the Chinese to the table for intellectual property violation. Not even that. And it caused us so much pain. Our agricultural sector has been decimated. Our exports have been decimated. The Chinese are buying agriculture from Canada and Argentina and Brazil. And these are long-term contracts. So we have lost out on that. Huawei trying to block them. Now they've accelerated their own R&D. And I'm not convinced 5G is really that big a deal. I'm really not convinced. Remember, 5G is a 4G platform. And there's a sense out there, it's all big new technology. 5G is an infrastructure thing. There are devices, thousands of devices, every street corner, every building, it's an infrastructure thing that a government like China can do because they're eminent domain of the whole country, you know? So it's, it's an infrastructure thing. So, but the trade war, I would get that behind me. It's a self-inflicted wound. And you know, you mentioned Reagan, um, um, I see big differences compared to 9-11, Dan. You know, on 9-11, on 9-12, what I saw soon after that was 
paranoia and anger in America. And anger is good because it, it precipitates action. What I'm seeing now is very deleterious. What I'm seeing now is depression, despondency, and despair. Those are killers and we call consumer confidence C-bar, investor confidence I-bar. Those are C-bar, I-bar killers, you know? And once confidence is gone, you can't get it back up. And so what I would say is, you know, the reason I liked Reagan, um, and you're right for spotting that, is he brought hope. You know, he brought hope. He, was his, he had his own goofy humor. He brought hope. And that's what we need. We need someone who can bring hope, bring confidence up, not someone who sucks the oxygen from the room and prays and, and revels in division and dichotomy and differences as opposed to uniting this country. So that's what I would hope for. You know, and what I've seen, what I'm seeing now is essentially we have asymmetric inf inflation, asymmetric information that's driving us all. It's a, like a social media separation. We have the people in CNN and MSNBC on one corner and the Fox News people on one corner and neither group are getting the full information. We are all getting asymmetric information. The real truth's in the middle somewhere in this cavernous room, which is echoing. There's no one in it, you know? And so we did a unifier. This is a house divided. A house divided cannot stand. You know, it seems appropriate to quote Lincoln on a day like this with a debate now an hour away. It's a house divided, so we need a unifier. And being an immigrant American, and you're a first generation American yourself, Dan, I, I kinda, I'm on the outside looking in, if you will. And I've seen that Americans are restless people, you know, they are very busy people. So it takes a long time for them to take to the streets, if you will. Um, it's happened finally, but you know, in Italy and Greece and so on, they're on the streets in the first hour. We finally wake up at the 11th hour, the 55th minute. But if I could talk to them, I would say in that to answer your question, I'm not an economist really as much as I'm a historian and you have a degree in history. I'm also an engineer, but I'm mostly a historian. And I would remember, I would remind Americans of our history. You know, it's, it's we always, it's just a comeback country. You know, the Revolutionary War, it should have ended at the Battle of Long Island, but a fog came up and we had our own Dunkirk and no one even knows about it, but it was touch and go. If that hadn't happened, there'd be no Revolutionary War, there'd be no Washington crossing the Delaware, there'd be no Yorktown. And then Civil War also, almost gone till Antietam, then Great Depression, so it's almost like we, we take body blows, but we come back. This is a comeback country. Pearl Harbor, Vietnam, JFK assassination, 9-11, you know. So I'll remind them that we bounce back. And I would also remind Americans and tell them the world has written us off. Again, every 20 years, the planet writes us off happily because they can't, there's so much envy out there. The America's experiment with democracy is over or the American saga, American chapter, the American century is over. This is, happens every 20 years. And they've written us off again. And so it's for us to bounce back. And one more time. And the thing is we have bounced back. Most of the big innovations come from here. Again, remind, remind Americans because we are so despondent. You go and talk to anybody and it's like, you know, they've thrown in the towel. They're believing this rhetoric from Europe and Asia and China and Russia, you know? And so look at automobiles, came from here. Aircraft came from here. We lost automobiles, our position automobile, we invented SUVs. We lost our position, we invented semiconductors. Well, we burnt out of that. We invented microprocessors, which we still are in. Computers from here. Well, that we burnt off the internet. And so, so we believe, have it. You believe in America, Froke, right? You believe in the comeback. The thing is, though, you and I might, Dan, but they don't out there. Yeah. And you people listening here might, but outside the public, they've been beaten down by these four years of depression and, and, and negative rhetoric. So I would tell the people, if I could, or the two contenders, that that's our history. And once we can act together, 
we can probably come up with the next big thing. And it will probably happen very quickly. Maybe as quickly as, you know, we maybe we'll see um, flamingos, not just in Florida, but all over America. It'll happen quickly. Broke, thank you. It's 8.05 right now. We have time for a few questions. Uh, I saw there's some great questions in the Q&A and, and a lot of them are asking you, Farouk, and if you, if you want to ask a question, you can type it in the Q&A section on, on the Zoom. Um, but there are a bunch of questions about our discussion with printing money. Um, so I'm going to ask, you know, there's try to summarize a couple of them. Uh, so the understanding is that printing money doesn't matter. So are the so-called fiscal conservatives, are they wrong? What are they worried about? Wow, great Why? question. Yeah. If I can just interject, this debate tonight, guys, yeah. back in the day, which is not that long ago, the last few elections, there'd be tons of questions on the deficits. The deficit would have been a big deal. Both contenders would be tiptoeing around, well, will you decrease deficits by raising taxes? Of course, that's the case of that. You'd never said that, even if you plan to, right? Joe, I hope you're listening. Um, will you cut government spending? Will you cut defense? So that was the, that was the, they'll be walking on eggshells around that question. I will be surprised if a deficit question even shows up tonight. And that's your great question from earlier. Do deficits matter? Well, not when you have a liquidity trap, not when you're at the safest cave and look, the sky didn't fall on our head at 10% and now at 16%, keep doing it. So, so that's kind of the second part of the question. So where does the printed, it doesn't just, the printed money doesn't just vanish, or does it? I mean, oh, wh no. where, does, where does it eventually go? And, and does it, how does it flood back into the economy? And that's from a question from one of our- Wow, so you know what? Uh, whoever, answer, whoever asked the question, you, the, that person and me, we are both lying awake at night worrying about this. I call this toothpaste money, okay? So you are Dan, you got this whole bag full of rotten mortgage-backed securities from the subprime crisis, Dan, okay? Um, 200 million, all right? So I'm going, Dan, I'm going to bail you out. I'm Ben Bernanke, all right? He's known as the anti langdana now, by the way. And so, Dan, I'm going to bail you out. Give me those rotten, or that rotten bag of mortgage securities, which you're left holding with, and I'm going to give you $200 million. So I've got that rotten bag of mortgage securities, and I've got all the junk bonds, which I'm buying now in the COVID crisis and printing money. And so essentially that money, I can't get back in. I call this toothpaste money. To get it, get to suck it back in, I would say, Dan, here's your bag of rotten mortgages. Can you give me that money back? And it's time for me to suck the money in. And Dan, you'll go, like, Dan, I get out of here. I don't want that back. What is that? It's dripping everywhere. It's, no, security, get this guy out of here. So, so that liquidity is called toothpaste money. Toothpaste, easy to get out, impossible to put back in. And that's fueling much of the stock market rally and we no one has any good idea how to suck it back in. One plan before COVID was to pay banks interest to not lend it because the banks are going, hey, I need to lend this money out. If, but A, there's nobody borrowing it. B, even if there are people who wanted to suddenly come, if the liquidity trap is over and suddenly everyone's borrowing money and spending it, which would be extremely dangerous, we would tell the banks, don't lend it. We're gonna pay you interest not to lend it. But no one's thought that far ahead. Well, the, but the one and a couple of the people have asked this in the Q&A about the real estate market, because if, if joblessness is high, investor confidence low, why is the residential real estate market booming at this time? Well, it's booming for record low long term mortgage rates, you know, so that's huge. And keep in mind, here is a story for you. A few weeks ago, I got an email from one of my students, my executive MBAs in China. Professor, do you like this house, this house, this house, or that house? One was in Canada, one was in Florida, the, and I said, and someone was a townhouse. I said, what do you mean do I like? What's this about? Oh, buying it. They're moving their money out. There's a hot capital inflow into the US from rest of the world in real estate. That's helping a lot. They're buying houses and townhouses sight unseen. I said, but you, have you come here? No, this is for my parents, you know? They're gonna try, I'm gonna try and they're in Canada, I'm gonna try and move them to US. And I said, but have you visited? No, but I did a 360 view. So I'm happy with what I see. So I, I bought that one. That was like 750 grand, sight unseen. So 
some of that's happening too, but more record low mortgage rates. You think real estate is a good investment? I mean, not with, well, you know what, Dan, there isn't much out there. I mean, you know, it's security, it's peace of mind. The interest advantage is essentially gone. You know, the, uh, the tax benefits essentially gone. But where else are you going to go? Treasuries? You know, right now you're losing interest in interest bearing assets. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, I think we have time for one more question, Farouk. Um, this came from Tara and she asks, um, can you imagine a scenario where America ceases to be where China stashes its cash? Wow. And, and if so, where does it go and what pattern emerges from that? Hi, Tara. So, yeah, so when China woke up and China, remember, China was a superpower and people roll their eyes when I talk like this because it's unfashionable to say anything good about China. But China was a superpower in economics and everything for thousands of years. Then for 250 years, it fell asleep and was colonized. Then it woke up in 1979. Anyway, so the China has been selling stuff to the rest of the world taking dollars in and then recycling the dollars back to some extent. But 75% of all the money China made, now it's 65% of all the money China has made is in our currency, dollars. And so they are stuck with us and they call it Chimerica. So as for a long, long time, no matter what the rhetoric, no matter how much we don't like each other, they are stuck with us, we are stuck with them. So China will not do anything to collapse the dollar because that's their money. And we, if we have any sense, will not annoy them too much because we need the capital inflow. It's recycled back in. But my big fear is both sides don't understand the macro. They don't understand these linkages. And that would be a problem. Farouk, thank you. You know, there's a lot of questions on there. And you said before that you'll take your time and you'll answer all the Q&A questions that you can, right? So we have your email. I think it's in the chat, Sharon, right? Um, yes, yeah, so I added uh, Professor Langdana's uh, email address and his Langdana blog post. You just type it into Google and you can go directly to the Langdana blog post. There's some great questions in there, Farouk. And great, and you know, I'll answer all of them, I promise. I did that the last... Um, webinar we had in March when the whole thing just happened, this whole COVID thing. So I ended up doing over a hundred responses in the next few days. So I will respond to every single one, but Sharon's going to say a few words and then don't go away. I have something for you. I'm going to leave you with some music as you get ready for the big debate and you make your popcorn and you bite your nails or say your prayers or whatever you plan to do. So don't go away. Thank you, Professor Langdana and Dan for an inspiring and insightful discussion. Uh, thank you alumni for joining the webinar this evening. And I'm handing it back to Farouk. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for organizing this. Um, thank you everyone for being here. So I just wanna leave you with this. What we are seeing now, this, this polarization in our country has happened before. My generation saw it. You know, now it's the social media separation. But in my time, it was Vietnam. And I was actually in India. I wasn't in the US when that happened. It was Vietnam, similar stuff. You know, parents not talking to kids, neighbors against neighbors, the North against the South, racism bubbling up. Um, it was Vietnam. And I'm sure, sadly, 20, 30 years from now, it'll probably be a repeat. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong there. But there was a song from my generation. It's really an anthem from my generation. So all of you old timers, you'll recognize it and you'll smile. And those of you hearing it for the first time, hear the words very carefully because they are very applicable. And I'm going to fade out with that. I'm going to turn this on and enjoy this. Hear the words. Let's go to screen share. Let's optimize and watch, hear the words carefully, folks. This was the anthem of my generation. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. 